Hello guys, during the next half an hour, we are going to be discussing Ernest Hemingway's novelette, The Old Man and the Sea. As you probably know, Hemingway was an American writer of short stories, novels, novelettes and non-fiction prose. He was born in Oak Park, Illinois in 1899 as a son of a doctor and a music teacher. After graduation from high school, he went to work as a journalist instead of attending college. At the age of 18, he went into military service. This was during the First World War. He volunteered to serve as a Red Cross ambulance driver. He also served as an infantry officer. At the age of 19, he was almost killed in a shrapnel burst in Italy. Hemingway fictionalized his war experiences in Italy in the famous novel, A Farewell to Arms, published in 1929. In 1921, Hemingway went to Paris. He worked as a correspondent there. There, he became part of a group of English and American expatriate writers whom Gertrude Stein called the Lost Generation. The group included Scott Fitzgerald, Ezra Pound, Gertrude Stein herself, and Ford Maddox Ford. Hemingway chronicled the disaffection felt by the American youth after the First World War. Two volumes of Hemingway's short stories, In Our Time, published in 1924, and Men Without Women, published in 1927, introduced him as a writer. The short story was a genre in which Hemingway particularly excelled. Hemingway went on to write two important works of non-fiction which reflected his lifelong interest in violent sports. These included Death in the Afternoon about bullfighting and Green Hills of Africa about big game hunting. In these pieces, Hemingway deliberately tried to build up the image of a mystical masculinity. His first important novel, Fiesta, published in 1926, was called The Sun Also Rises in America. Narrated in the first person, The Sun Also Rises deals with the predicament of the hero who is rendered impotent by an unfortunate war wound. He is frustrated in his love for an English woman whom time and misfortune have driven into alcoholism, nymphomania, and self-destructive irresponsibility. The hero has learned to accept his condition with honesty and courage. Even the heroine, though morally ruined, is honest with herself. The hero's own moral courage enables him to be compassionate towards her. In A Farewell to Arms, published in 1929, Hemingway tried to communicate directly his own experiences of being wounded by trench mortar fire. The novel is a romantic tragedy of love and war. The novels A Sun Also Rises and A Farewell to Arms established Hemingway as a dominant literary voice of his time. The novel To Have and To Have Not, published in 1937, showed his interest in social and political issues. This was confirmed by his experience as an observer in the Spanish Civil War. By the time of the Second World War, Hemingway was accepted as the grand old man of modern American fiction. The novel For Whom the Bell Tolls, published in 1940, is commonly regarded as Hemingway's masterpiece. Here, Hemingway builds up a novel of epic dimensions. It is built around the dynamiting of a bridge by a guerrilla group and the love affair between an American partisan and a girl in the group. The decade that followed this novel was one of silence. This is partly because of Hemingway's transformation from a writer into a public figure who was bent upon asserting his prowess as a playboy, a drunkard, and a sportsman. 
Critics believed that imagination had deserted Hemingway. This was confirmed by the failure of his next novel, Across the River and Into the Trees. However, the huge success of The Old Man and the Sea, published in 1952, re-established Hemingway's reputation as a writer. This novel, it was a popular success, selling 5.3 million copies within two days after its publication in a special edition of Life magazine. The novella won the 1953 Pulitzer Prize for Fiction. It was also cited by the Nobel Committee while awarding the Nobel Prize in Literature to Ernest Hemingway. It was the last novel published during his lifetime. During his last years, Hemingway suffered bouts of depression. He committed suicide in 1961. His memoirs, entitled A Movable Feast, was published posthumously. Today, Hemingway is recognized as one of the foremost American writers of the 20th century. But there are also adverse critical opinions. Some critics consider Hemingway's preoccupation with courage and violence as a bombastic pose. They regard his emphasis on romantic love as reminiscent of Hollywood. They also think that his terse prose style is a bit philistine. In the 1930s, Hemingway had lived in Cuba. His experience of fishing in the Gulf Stream and the Caribbean provided the background for the vivid descriptions of a fisherman's craft in The Old Man and the Sea. In 1936, he wrote a journalistic piece entitled On the Blue Water. It was about a Cuban fisherman who was dragged out to sea by a great marlin. A marlin is a big game fish which weighs hundreds of pounds. The story was a seed for the novel The Old Man and the Sea. But Hemingway succeeds in developing a novel of great richness and depth out of this simple anecdote. Hostile critics had assumed that Hemingway's best days of writing were past and some kind of irreversible deterioration had taken place. This theory was proved false with the publication of the novelette The Old Man and the Sea in 1952. The novelette received wide critical acclaim. Many critics praised it as a splendid little classic, a small masterpiece. Many compared it to the other great works of American literature, such as Herman Melville's Moby Dick. The popular impact of the book was incredible. Sermons were preached on it. The author received a hundred laudatory letters every day. People kissed him on the street, weeping. Told in a few words, The Old Man and the Sea is a story of an epic struggle between an old seasoned fisherman and the greatest catch of his life. The protagonist is a Cuban fisherman named Santiago. For 84 days, he has returned empty-handed from the sea. He is so conspicuously unlucky that the parents of his young apprentice and friend Menolan have forced the boy to work with other more successful fishermen. Nevertheless, the boy is devoted and continues to care for the old man. He helps his master carry his gear to his hut, gets food for him and discusses American baseball, especially the old man's hero, the Yankee star, Joe Maggio, whose father was an Italian-American fisherman in San Francisco. On the 85th day, determined to break his run of bad luck, Santiago sails his skiff far beyond the coastal waters and ventures into the Gulf Stream. He leaves the other fishermen behind. He prepares his lines and drops them into deep waters. At noon, a big fish, a marlin, 
takes his bait. The old man skillfully hooks a fish, but he cannot pull it in. The fish has proved its strength and intelligence, for instead of jerking at the line in panic, it begins to swim steadily away, pulling the boat in its wake. Santiago cannot fasten the line for fear that the fish would snap it. He is obliged to hold the line by hand all the time. He bears the strain with his shoulders, back and hands, ready to give slack should the marlin make a run. The fish tows the boat along for two days and two nights. Now Santiago is far out of sight of land. All this while, the old man endures a constant pain from the fishing line. Whenever the fish leaps or makes a dash for freedom, the cord lacerates his palm. The old man is wounded, sleepless and exhausted, but he is undaunted and determined to conquer his worthy and dignified foe alone. Even in the midst of his ordeal, he feels a compassion, an empathy, an admiration for the marlin. He refers to the fish as his brother because it shares his suffering, strength and resolve. On the third day, the fish tires and begins to circle the skiff. Though aching and nearly delirious, Santiago manages to bring the marlin along, alongside the skiff and kills it with a harpoon. The marlin is the largest Santiago has ever seen. He lashes it to his boat and sets sail for home. Then begins a second ordeal of the story. The marlin's blood leaves a trail in the water. This attracts sharks. A big mako shark attacks the marlin and begins to rip away its flesh. Santiago manages to slay it with the harpoon but loses the harpoon and lengths of precious rope. This leaves him vulnerable to other shark attacks. The old man struggles hard to fight off the predators. Although he kills several sharks, more and more appear. They devour the marlin's precious meat, leaving only the skeleton, the head and the tail. The old man arrives home before daybreak. He is crushed in body and spirit. He makes his way to his shack, carrying the heavy mast on his shoulder. Then he falls asleep. The next morning, a crowd of fishermen gathers round the skeletal carcass of the marlin. They are astounded by its size. It is 18 feet in length. Completely ignorant of the old man's struggle, some tourists also gather round the remains of the fish. They mistake it for a shark. Menolin, Santiago's apprentice, has been worried about the old man's absence. When he sees his master safe on his bed, he is moved to tears. The boy fetches the old man some coffee and the daily newspapers with the baseball scores. He watches him asleep. When Santiago wakes, the two agree to fish together once again. The old man tells the boy, a man can be destroyed but not defeated. He goes to sleep again and dreams his usual dream of lions playing on the beaches of Africa. Let us now explore the themes and motives of the novelet. The most important theme in The Old Man and the Sea is heroism and noble manhood. Awarding the Nobel Prize to Ernest Hemingway, the Nobel Committee talked about its natural admiration for every individual who fights the good fight in a world of reality overshadowed by violence and death. Santiago, the protagonist of The Old Man and the Sea, embodies what is called the Hemingway Code. Many of Hemingway's fictional heroes represent a code 
If the hero could attain the values of this code, he would be able to live properly in the world of violence, disorder and misery of which he is part. The code hero exemplifies certain principles of courage, honor and endurance. These principles enable him to conduct himself well in the losing battle that is life. The code hero shows in Hemingway's famous phrase, grace under pressure. This is the final recourse of all his protagonists. San Diego is rendered weak by age and isolation. He is no longer the strong man who defeated his opponent in a fist fight in Casablanca. But he does not suffer loss of manhood because manhood, according to Hemingway, is not physical but spiritual. With his willed endurance, pride and courage, Santiago emerges strong like a typical Hemingway code hero. When faced with defeat in his struggle against the marlin and the sharks, he does not give up. He is undaunted. He continues the struggle with courage and perseverance. The issue here is dignity rather than success. The essence of this kind of noble heroism is summarized in the statement, a man can be destroyed but not defeated. You might lose, but what matters is how you conduct yourself while being destroyed. That is how you triumph over crushing adversity. Hemingway's The Old Man and the Sea deals with one of the oldest and grandest themes in literature, the relationship between man and nature. Melville's Moby Dick is focused on the malevolence of nature and Captain Ahab's monomaniacal hatred of the white wild. But Hemingway's Old Man feels a sense of union with nature. This is implied in the way he is described at the beginning of the novelette. Here Hemingway draws his images from nature itself. Santiago's eyes were of the same color as the sea. Santiago uses a feminine pronoun to refer to the sea. He loves the sea. He accepts its hardships and cruelties as one might accept the fickleness of the woman one loves. He bathes his raw and bleeding hands in the soothing seawater. Here, hunting is not an expression of antagonism, but a way of cultivating a deeper intimacy. When Santiago sees the marlin for the first time, he admires its size and beauty. In fact, a major part of the novelette is devoted to the development of Santiago's attitude to this, the sea and the fish. In fact, a major part of the novelette is devoted to the development of the old man's attitude towards the fish. At first, he welcomes it as an end to his bad luck and a source of much needed income. Then he comes to respect its strength and intelligence. The marlin is a worthy foe. He wishes that he might feed the fish, his brother. When the fish is close enough to the harpoon, the old man pleads with it not to kill them both. For a fleeting moment in admiration, almost in mystical love, he exclaims that he would not care if the noble creature, at once his brother and enemy in nature, killed him. But Santiago knows that his own strength must be greater if he is to prevail. He tells himself, you were born to be a fisherman as a fish was born to be a fish. You killed him for pride and because you are a fisherman, you loved him when he was alive and loved him after. Santiago's attitude towards nature, the sea and the fish are an aspect of Hemingway's transcendental pantheism. 
This is something which is distinct from the Christian thread of the novel. What we find here is an intuitive, instinctive, mystical communion with all the forms of nature, which is as elemental and deep-rooted as other forms of religious devotion. Awarding the Nobel Prize for Literature to Hemingway, the Swedish Academy commented on the central themes of his work, courage and compassion in a world of violence and death. Hemingway's heroes are helpless victims of cosmic, social, physical and psychological forces which are beyond their control. His heroes are people without free will, without any control over their destiny. In such a cosmos, Santiago celebrates the religion of man by showing grace under pressure. Despite his epic individualism and the necessity of fighting nature, Santiago feels a love for the creatures who share with him a world of inescapable violence. The novelette also deals with the relationship between individualism and interdependence. Of course, Santiago's tenacious fight with the marlin and the sharks is an act of individualism, unrelenting individualism. But Femingway's protagonist also learns the importance of solidarity and interdependence. Far out in the sea, his thoughts go back to his apprentice, Manolin. He wishes that the boy had been with him. In his fatigue and alienation, he thinks that nobody should be left alone in their old age. Santiago's wife is dead. His youth has left him. The boy is also withdrawn. This is also a time of bad luck for him. Santiago is also cut off from the fisherman community. He feels that in going alone and far out beyond all the people, he has ruined both himself and the fish. Santiago's condition seems to be a plea for human fellowship. According to Melvin Backman, The Old Man in the Sea features two motifs, the matador and the crucified. As you probably know, the matador is a bullfighter who performs the final passes and kills the bull. The matador represents a great force held in check, releasing itself proudly in controlled yet violent administering of death. The crucified stands for the acceptance of pain even unto death with all of one's courage and endurance. This becomes a thing of poignance and nobility. Santiago has a strength and controlled the energy of a matador. The procedure which he follows in hooking the fish is similar to the bullfighter's code followed in killing the bull. Of course, there is a difference between the two situations. In the case of bullfighting, the violence is orchestrated in an artificial atmosphere. In the case of Santiago's drama in the Gulf Stream, it occurs in a natural atmosphere. Santiago is also depicted as a Christ figure. We will discuss this in detail when we come to the symbolism of the novel. In The Old Man in the Sea, we find an exquisite blend of realism and symbolism. Of course, Hemingway cultivates a very careful surface realism and gives a minute and particular account of Santiago's actions and thoughts. But Hemingway once said, no book has ever been written that has in its symbols arrived at beforehand and stuck in. I tried to make a real old man, a real boy, a real sea, and a real fish and real sharks, 
But if I made them good and true enough, they would mean many things. He also said, I always try to write by the famous theory of the iceberg. There is seven eighths of it underwater. For every part that shows, there is much more than what will be read at any first reading. At the symbolic level, the work, The Old Men and the Sea, can be read as an allegory of human life or of Christ's crucifixion. Remember that in the book, Santiago is referred to as the old man and Menolin as the boy. Probably Hemingway wanted these characters to function as typical universal figures. The fish, the marlin itself is a symbol. It is the ideal opponent, worthy and dignified. Let us first look at the Christian symbolism of the old man under sea. Santiago is a symbol. Look at his name. It is the Spanish form of Saint James, a fisherman apostle like Peter. Santiago de Compostelo is the patron saint of Spain and is greatly revered by Cuban Catholics. Hemingway intended the fisherman to be a saint and Christ figure in an allegorical sense. Melolin has a religious devotion to his master. Like Christ's disciples who deserted him during the pre-crucifixion ordeal, Menolin begs his master's pardon for not fishing him with him anymore. Santiago symbolizes Christ-like essence of willed suffering. He spits blood and his hands are filled with pain. When his palms are first cut by the fishing line, the reader cannot help but think of Christ suffering his stigmata. When the sharks attack, he salutes them with a despairing eye. Look at Hemingway's characterization of this sound. I, he said aloud, there is no translation for this word. And perhaps it is just a noise such as a man might make involuntarily, feeling the nail go through his hands and into the wood. Santiago shoulders his mast and climbs up the hill with great difficulty. In a stupor of tiredness, he stumbles and falls down, but he gets up and continues his journey. He has to rest several times in his exhaustion and agony. This is a parallel to the holy way of Christ's passion. He reaches his hut and lies down with his hands straight out and the palms of his hands up in the position of the cross. Menolin, the disciple, looks at his master's bloodied hands and weeps at the signs of the noble agony. Let me add a qualification to this Christian symbolism. Hemingway had little patience with those who use prayer as a crutch. He despised attempts to manhandle God by begging for favor. Santiago's religion is a kind of non-Christian paganism rather than Orthodox Christianity. He refuses to turn to God as a mechanism for victory. Of course, he calls out to the Christian deity in the depths of his agony. But he considers the Christian concept of sin a distraction. The concept of sin is irrelevant to the ritual of sacred manhood in which the only true altar for a man is the altar of his own flesh. Santiago is also an allegory of the grandeur of aged isolation and manhood. He is old but not senile, unlucky but not defeated, gentle but not soft, proud but not boastful, resigned but not passive. His hopeful nature represents a poetry of the human spirit. He dreams about lions playing on the beaches of Africa. Do these lions represent anything? 
The lions communicate a particular quality of emotion which serves to complement the themes of the work. Nobility and grandeur, simplicity of power without meanness and eternal youth. Santiago is young in spirit though not in flesh. So it is quite appropriate that he should dream about the lions and not about women or wealth. Also remember that the last time Santiago dreams about the lions is when he goes to sleep after an agonizing and exhausting adventure at the sea. Here the lions at play also convey a promise of regeneration. Symbolically, Santiago also represents the artist who tries to do the impossible by going too far out. Every artist must do this if he is to be true to his vocation. Those who stay too close to shore, who never go too far out, are precisely those for whom the big one is either a myth or an illusion. And in those far out and perilous seas, where the individual is supported only by his pride, will and endurance, there are many sharks waiting to feed upon his victory. These are the critics whom Hemingway considered a brand of parasites who feed upon the artist's victory, who destroy the meaning of his sacrifice and agony. Remember that the adverse criticism of his work across the river and into the trees was a catalyst for the writing of The Old Man and the Sea. No wonder the work is considered a veiled attack upon the critics. Technically, The Old Man and the Sea is a work of flawless craftsmanship. Hemingway was a meticulous writer. He worked slowly and revised extensively. It is said that he read through the manuscript of The Old Man and the Sea about 200 times. Let me conclude this discussion with some observations on Hemingway's style with special reference to The Old Man and the Sea. Hemingway's is a spare but charged style of writing. It was revolutionary at the time and was imitated by several generations of writers. Archibald MacLeish once said that Hemingway whittled a style for his time. It is simple graphic declarative prose, but it is simplicity of a different order. It aims at biblical grandeur. Hemingway stripped American prose of adjectival coloring and broke irrevocably with ornate idiom and literary mannerisms. He deliberately cultivated short, lucid sentences using simple words and colloquial idioms. His style consists of a terse representation of simple facts sparse dialogue and understatement of emotion. When he describes Santiago's ordeal with the marlin and the sharks, he is deliberately inexpressive, concealing his protagonist's pain and despair. So, what did we discuss in the last half an hour? We began with an introduction to Hemingway's life and work. Then we had a plot summary of his novelette, The Old Man and the Sea. We went on to discuss the major themes and motives of the old man and the sea. Then we looked at the symbols in the work. We concluded with a brief discussion of Hemingway's style in the old man and the sea. Thank you.